Right, so um, before I introduce the, um, the last uh, of our speakers, I uh, kind of had to put this into framework, into frame a little bit, uh, because I thought uh, when I was thinking about the symposium and multicultural algorithms, um, I wanted the, you know, my, my first instinct obviously is going with academia, scholars, how they're thinking these things. And then at some point I thought, well, there is that part of the question, but then there is business and how business think the user, how they actually implement that vision, sometimes without, maybe not, not knowledge, but without care for what, um, academics are doing. And in that sense, I think it's really interesting to see kind of what kind of gap we can find if there is between uh, academia and how users and multiculturalism and all these things are researched and how this is practiced in business under a business imperative. And this is what um, you're going to see now. So how is business thinking the user under that business framework and the kind of technical side of things and also the research side of things. So um, let me present our first speaker, who's going to be Jill Bowen. She's a lead researcher at Alassian. She completed a PhD in anthropology at Macquarie University before moving into the digital copywriting and user experience in 2015. Uh, she has worked for the Digital Transformation Agency in their digital identity program for the Australian Digital Health Agency on the rollout of My Health uh, record and Alassian, where she completed qualitative strategic research uh, into the needs of enterprise software users. She's a, she has also worked as a social and community manager for a small digital advertising firm and completed award school. And after Jill, there will be Gig, Gig Hemotaki. She will be talking more of the technical side. Uh, she's a lead product designer in Alassian. She has worked with different design practices such as graphic design, branding, environmental graphics, digital design, and now she's working on product design. Gig is formally trained as a graphic designer. She has, she, she has worked across different fields in the user experience. And then when she started from her jobs in startups in Chicago and then moved to Sydney, uh, she, her role has evolved from improving, improving the customer visual experience to understanding user needs in collaboration with both researchers and software developers. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. Thank you for having us. Um, as we've been said, I'm Jill, this is Gig, and we didn't plan to match, but that happened. We're not selling anything, yeah. I promise. <laughs> um, how do I advance the slides? I think I click. 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 You can do Q click. Fancy. I okay. Know. So just to kick off with a bit of a disclaimer, while the two of us work for Atlassian, we're not official spokespeople for the company. We're just going to be sharing and reflecting on our own experiences across several industry roles that we've held. Um, and during this conversation, we're going to talk about why we care about users, um, building on what Ruben shared about the idea of a kind of business imperative and how that frames the subject. We'll talk about designing for users. That's going to be mostly gig. We'll talk about how we understand users and how we deliver value for users as a means of balancing business and customer needs. So to start off, I want you to think about something you use every day and whether you feel it was designed for you, because this was something that we wanted to start with, how would you know that something sort of worked for you in your context? And um, whoops, I think I wanted to start with this as well. This is from Youngblood and Cheslook. We all have user experiences. So some of the products and services we experience are ones we deliberately seek out. Some we experience simply because they're designed into the physical or social structure and are, and are unavoidable. So there are lots of different means by which we engage with products and services. Some of them we choose to use, some are just sort of part of the fabric of life now. So why do we care about the user? More or less, we care about the users because they're potential consumers of the products and services that we design. So while there's a commercial imperative behind much research completed in for-profit enterprises, design thinking and user research are applied to a broad range of social and not-for-profit products and services too including those designed by governments. 
There's a broad agreement that better designed products are more commercially viable, though what it might mean to be better designed is open to interpretation. And if you want to think about this, you can think about kind of like the cult of Apple and the cult of Steve Jobs as being a good sort of sociocultural example of this, you know, better designed is better for business, design the right thing, et cetera. In the not-for-profit context, including in service design, well-designed experiences are more or less the cornerstone of self-service. So when users can self-serve, this improves access, reduces the needs to attend in-person meetings or to call call centers. And of course, self-service can also reduce costs for service providers, and that can be an imperative as well. <laughs> um, I wanted to share this quote from Jerry McGovern, who is the originator of the Top Tasks framework. So this is one of the user research frameworks that we use. Um, organizations used to have a lot of control over the, over the customer. Okay, this is this kind of framing. The product didn't need to be that fantastic as long as you had fantastic marketing and advertising. If the interface was clunky and unintuitive, they, then they always had the manual or support staff. That world is fading. Organizations need to make things simple today. They need to understand the customer and user much better. The design of their products must be genuinely intuitive, so simple even a distracted adult can understand it. So this is kind of like, um, how to describe this? This is where you get this kind of, it's good for business to have good design. It's not good enough to kind of put out an interface that people can't make sense of and use on their own. It has to be appealing. Mm. We often hear the word delight in our context. It has to be delightful to the user. What does that mean? <laughs> Otherwise, it's just no cigar. You're not going to get uptake. You're not going to get adoption. You're not going to get virality. You're not going to make any money. Um, and just to add to this, because this was a forcing function for me to think, like, where did this whole story of the user come from? The construct emerged as part of our just software development practice. So I'm not an engineer. He's probably nope. closer to engine than I am. <laughs> but we know that user stories were a common framework through which uh, developers captured requirements to build functionality and then test that system worked as intended. So if you, we've got a point there from the Agile Manifesto, which is the beginning of Agile, Agile software development in the early 2000s. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And one of the means to do that was via user stories. So user stories are templated text. Um, the template, this is actually a Atlassian branded piece of collateral, but you could find this anywhere on the internet where it starts as, as a person, whoever that person is, I want to X so that I can. So I don't know, example of that. Great. <laughs> As an end user, maybe. Yeah, I want to be able to like upload a photo so that my fan and my Instagram could see. Yeah, that could be one. exactly. Yeah. So you would build the user story and then you would put the user story through user acceptance testing to see if the system worked in the way that the story required it to. So this kind of st like user stories became a normative way that requirements were captured and then built. And this was part of that early focus on users. This is how um, early framing of user experience came, in, came into focus via um, development. Right. Are we up to you now, Gig? Uh -huh. Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you. I usually ask people to do exercise for it, but this is not our company. <laughs> <laughs> um, so designing for user, anyone's familiar with the design thinking framework? Yay, okay. There's so many form, many names. Some people call it like the latest trend, we call them like system thinking mm -hmm. methodologies too. That's a, so many different companies also tailor it to their own company. We also have different way and like Mike Golf or UK also have a different name, but basically the essential of it, it just, um, we call it like it's another, another things that we used to use, um, call it double diamonds framework, basically two diamonds. And I do think it's like kind of like foundations of how I start working or start designing something. Think about like our user. Um, there's many names, but I think the 40s, I think it's a work for me so far from like when I start uh, my career. So discovery, discover, define, develop and deliver. So as you can see, it's like a double diamonds for a reason. And um, basically when we start discover, we kind of going broad on the topic, which is we going to start with, um, Oh, I make this. All right. Okay. So we're going to start with, like, I'm a designer. So I'm, I have a lot of pictures. Do a researcher, you have a lot of text. So we can see the difference here. So anyway, so uh, for this cover, we always start with research questions. So we're going really broad on a topic on like, whatever, like, if I, when I was a consultant, I got like customer will be like, I want to build this fancy thing for my use, for my customer. 
Now I work at the like as a product designer. We just try to improve our product within the company or the software that we work with. So research questions a good start. That's when me and Jill start working together. That's when we met. <laughs> and then also we also start. Some people also start with the hypothesis too, um, to prove that is this assumption something that we know or whatnot. And then we're gonna start with the another um, what do you call it exploratory user interview. So we want to make sure that all these hypotheses and research questions got answered by a specific group of user. And also at the end, it's kind of diverge and we're going broad. And once we talk to user, we ask more like a stakeholders, experts in the field, if you like expert in this particular platform, particular subjects, and we talk to them and then we kind of get an answer of like, all right, this is where we should focus on. And, and then we're gonna start defining problems and, and kind of like focusing on what we know and start shaping down to like the different type of problems. So that's when we start focusing on like the diamond shapes. And after that, it's time to develop and deliver. Yeah. And then, so from there, once we define what the problems are, we're just gonna start um, think about design solutions. In this area, you put like troublemakers in the room. So I will put somebody who like, I don't like what you're doing. So I put them in the rooms like, then draw me what you think it is. <laughs> so usually I'm not really impose any crazy methodologies or workshop. I don't really name things. I would just say, let's draw something together based on the problem that we try to solve. So you put different people such as like stakeholder, like leaderships, um, bosses, or like PM product managers, or even like customer service or customer support and um, to draw all these solutions together. And from there, go back to Jill, and we, we kind of go along this journey together. But um, so, and after that, we put concept together and then also do a little bit about user testing to test it again, and this concept is working. And after that, we just gonna, and then I'm gonna work more with like, with the engineers to make sure whatever we try to um, develop makes sense to the user and makes sense to the engineers. So, um, so what code pairing with the, the, with the engineers actually useful, like, Sometimes you have heard about like, oh, designer work in this black box and then hand over to the developers and they just read all this like 30,000 scripts. And I feel like this, the, the industry evolved just a little bit maybe. And then, um, so now basically like we like pair together. So we work next to each other to make sure that whatever on the staging, on the website, on, on the platform makes sense what I, we have been designed or discussed before. And to deliver, this is the fun part. This is when you see the numbers, like engagement, or do you see different measurements coming in? And that from there, we're just going to kind of like do it different iterations. Oh, we stop right there. So it's just like a small part of it. And again, like different section, different themes in there. We could talk about that for another hours. But uh, for now, just going to keep it high level. But if you guys have any questions, we can talk about that afterward. And another thing I want to talk about when we get to design solutions. Yes. Oops. Oh. I never used, I only in Zoom. I never used this remote before. Okay. Bread practices in design. So in my career, I feel like there's three things that I think it's best for me that I've been using for, for my, um, in my, in my experience. The first one is usability heuristics. So this is like the good one to audit your software to make sure that it's checkbox of like, so you don't want to load all this cognitive load for the user. We want to make sure that the user have all these heuristic needs. So basically that your software will have all the things that they need when the user coming in. The second thing is around accessibility. Um, this thing is kind of new for me. Accessibility, it's kind of like, so, when you in the uh, in the company that could support some sort of accessibility design, it's kind of nice to have that. I'm kind of learn. I'm learning as I go, so I just want to share what I have learned so far about accessibility, how to make your product accessible for different type of user, and last but not least, content design. This is like luxury. I never worked with content design before. When I start working in like more corporate job, I get content designer. It's like another job. You can hear about it. It's like UX writing. UX content, so they're like super, it's like an art of writing. I, I can't talk so much. I work with them, I don't work for them. I mean, anyway. So anyway, for next one, we, let's talk a little bit more on usability heuristic, what a full word, okay. Next. 
All right, so just like a little bit of like how this um, met methodology is actually really helpful when I was working as a design consultant. A lot of clients coming to me like how to make my product better or how to actually make this new software. I want to make money for it, how to make it better. So this is how I give to my clients when I work as a consultant. Like I'm going to evaluate your um, software and then based on these evaluations and I want to point out the design challenges in your software and this is how we're going to match with a theme, which is really useful for any level of designer, um, especially when I have to mentor like junior designer. It's like pretty great theme for, for to anchor what we're trying to talk about when we talk about design a usability or user experience. And I can give a sample of the first one. Um, the first one is around um, visibility of system status. This one probably like the most, everyone could relate to this actually, like when you're really hungry, you order from Uber Eats, you wanna know where your food at, at one point. Sometimes menu lock doesn't do that, you get upset. <laughs> so like, again, I'm not trying to say Uber Eats is the best, but I think it's really great to show the step of like where your food at, in the ecosystem before it get to you. Um, so that's like this example of it. The second thing is about accessibility. Um, so accessibility is like, basically it's from design um, interaction design.org. And basically we wanna make sure that our software actually support who have, people who have cognitive and learning disabilities, blindness, speech inputs, and hearing impaired, but also moderate dex dexterity. Right, okay. And all this stuff, like we um, basically, but if I want to learning the easy sample that I have um, applies uh, in our design early process is around color contrast. Oh, that's my. So basically, there's so many ways to support accessibility design. One of the good samples that everyone could relate is around like, if you have like sort of like visual impair, you cannot read contrast really well, we can use this kind of guideline that um, kind of make sure that the color is not too um, too dark or too, not, not, not too like light when you put like the text color on the background. Um, so that's one of the sample. Um, next thing it's about, Okay, content design. Anyone know about content design in our tech world? Yay, okay. I love content designer. I, I, I always call them an art of writing for tech. There's like so high demand. And also like basically they have to make sure that they understand the company voice of tone too. It's like part partially marketing, partially researcher too. Make sure that they know how to write, not, not like dropping some lingo like for, for our company, we drop a bunch of lingo and tech lingo in there. So that they are really good at simplifying the language. And also another thing, they have this art of writing around, like they have to make sure when they write something and it's easy to translate to other languages. So they cannot just like whip something out of the back. They have to make sure it be able to translate well. And also simple writing. Thanks for adding the age. So that's something that I didn't know. The way they write also have like, make sure that um, the eight, the reading age of 12 is a target. And there's so much more into this. So I, it could be an, I'm not a content designer. I couldn't get her in, but next time if you want to know more, I'll drag her in and we can talk all about content designer. Um, that's also a crucial ingredient. So before passing to Jill, this is actually interesting. Based on the two works, all tools and framework that I've been applying, another thing that's really important is like, where we have to think where our user is at in this system. Like for example, if we talk about new clients, they have fun, innovative idea. There could be a new whole new system and you have to understand where that system, where the user is at in there. And, and again, if you work for Microsoft, Google, Boeing, or even Alassian, our system is like existing in the 2010 to 20 years. So you have to understand where are you at with those legacy baggage that you try to design it for how the user and the user get more complicated too because we got like the user who loved this product for 10 years and you have a new user who tried to use the product their fresh user that tried to use in a just born for the first year so how do we um, decide for those type of user when they get to complex system um that's all i have for my session and then i'll pass it to jill it's a good segue hey <laughs> Yeah, so just um, before I go on, I also, oh, hold on. 
Yeah. So this is, um, we, we had a look and we know that our primary product, which is called Jira, is supported in 19 languages, um, which I was very pleased to learn. Yeah. And also just on what Gig was saying about accessible design, we find that when you make a product more accessible, everybody has a better experience using it because it kind of forces people like on the simple writing side and on the, the, the way that hierarchy is organized, the tab order, for example, for somebody using an assistive device, when you're forced to really focus on that and improve it and test with a number of devices, you can make the experience better for everyone. So I chose this um, poster from Gov UK, which is kind of like the world authority on best practice design for service design and government. And it's um, only accessible services meet the government standard. But there's another one that says accessible surface, services are cheaper services. And there's another one that says accessible design is better for everyone. So one of the things that we do, like Ig mentioned writing, mm -hmm. there's a fun little app called Hemingway. And we have to QA any copy that says, OK, what score does Hemingway give it? And it's a, it's a tool to assess how simple the writing is and how comprehensible it is. It'll highlight text where you've gone a bit fruity or you've added maybe too many subordinate clauses or you've done something that doesn't make sense. You've used jargon. Like, I know, jargon, like sprint. We used the word yeah. sprint. Yeah, so it'll for, it's a forcing function to say, okay, we have our little bubble. How does it actually work out there in the world? So um, I want to just give a high level discussion about how we think about users, how we make sense of their needs. Um, so user research is an interdisciplinary practice. It leverages methodologies and approaches from industrial design, from psych, from anthropology, computer, human computer interaction, human factors and market research. And it's a kind of magpie discipline that just picks and chooses what it likes from all those different things. We also work very closely with design mm -hmm. and there are lots of people who are much more quant focused who might have far more advanced quantitative and measurement skills. Um, I think one of the interesting trends that we've seen in the last couple of years is the emergence of data science is a really key partner for user research. Mm -hmm. So I've seen, for example, that there are some people hedging their goals around any insight I deliver has to also be mapped to uh, product data science or behavioral data that we can use. Um, how we might think about users. So these are some examples from the practice that I've adopted or seen in the time that I've worked in UX. So in some case, we think about the user as a role assigned by a system. So we might think of them as an administrator or a help seeker or a patient or a buyer. It's this kind of categorical understanding of the user, which is determined on what the system um, is going to do for them. Another way we think about it, there's a whole set of frameworks in UX, some of them branded, some yeah. of them basic, around the individual completing a task as a kind of job performer or a person with top tasks or prioritized needs. So one of them is the jobs to be done framework, which you might have heard one. The other one is top tasks. Um, and these are kind of prioritization frameworks that help the business decide what to build or what to change, particularly in a legacy product. Um, there's the whole story of customer personas. And boy, is that a rabbit hole to go down <laughs> if you've got a whole lot of spare time. Um, so those can be very UX focused. And that's around the sort of task, the job performer, the what does the person need to do in the system. There's also the more marketing framework that's used for personas, which is kind of like likes and dislikes, places they like to go. It's kind of um, more... I don't know, psychosocial, yeah. as opposed to utilitarian and focus on the sort of job that they're trying to do in the system. And then there's also a member of a market or a consumer segment. So for example, at Atlassian, we do a lot of discussion about knowledge workers, but you could also think about a segment being people who live in remote areas, people who prefer particular kinds of devices. I don't know, people who dwell on, on some platforms more so than others. Um, this is a quote from Alan Cooper. Has anyone heard of Cooper? He's one of those sort of like fathers of UX people. Although satisfying the user is our goal, the term user causes trouble. Its imprecision makes it unusable, like removing an appendix with a chainsaw. So this is from his book, which is one of the sort of famous canonical books in UX, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And it's a concept that he invented called the elastic user. So when we're thinking about the user, there's two kind of poles that we want to try and stay in the middle of. On the one hand is a framing of the user that's so narrow that the product and service will only work for a very small code of, of cohort of users with niche requirements. And in my experience, this is often used, not intentionally, but as a way to justify changes that might not have a solid ground in user needs, um, particularly in products where it's hard to make some, harder to make some changes than others. The other one is more the elastic user concept, which I've got the Homer, Homer Simpson car for, which is where the user expands to whatever the system already wants to do. 
So if we think that the user, if we want the system to have, say, a wizard, we'll imagine the user to be a naive individual who doesn't know how to use a computer. If we want to have 15 different kinds of configuration screens, we might imagine the user to be highly technical and engaged with such behaviors. So the reason Ellen Cooper formulated this idea was to force developers into an understanding that the user is not elastic, the user is situated. How do we understand their needs and goals in context to make sure that we don't underdesign for their needs and we don't end up with what I've put there, which is feature It's just too much stuff in the product that actually makes it harder to use and engage with. Um, is this this cohort slide gig? Mm. <laughs> Visibility of system status. What is going on here? It's like <laughs> done for the day. It's you, Friday. you can sense my anxiety growing. No. <laughs> Let's see. How Help. many reach is this? Oh, Thank yeah. you. Okay, we can advance. Good guess. All right. Um, I'll, I'll click for you now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how we deliver value. So balancing business and customer needs, as Giggs put one there, it's a very important feedback loop. It's a series of loops. So we do a whole lot of different kinds of research activities, usually at the bequest of our stakeholders who are like, we've got this problem, we can't agree on something, we don't understand this, we think there's a market opportunity. Um, these people want to do this thing, what's the impact on this cohort of users? Uh, we want to baseline how, how well people can complete core tasks in the product. We want to design an additional thing that will sit on top of the platform. We want to engage with this market segment. There's all these different kinds of drivers for user research. Um, and often you'll do generative, which could be discovery interviews, paper prototyping, ethnographic research, diary studies, like you mentioned, all these different kinds of things to understand the context. And then once you've actually built the thing, hopefully in iterative chunks based on the agile methodology, you'll do evaluative research as well. And that could be behavioral, it could be data science-based. This is sort of net promoter score, which is very uncool, um, but it's a very common way that people evaluate the effectiveness of experiences. So yeah, that's a kind of, in the software delivery life cycle, there's all these different activities that we do. Next. I love that you say uncool. Well, I mean, you know, it's not very fashionable at all. I don't know, the last one I just put these graphics together to explain it like, so I got questions sometimes like, when do you know when designs end? It's like when you're done with your design. Like, I feel like there's a time frame that we block when you're finishing design, like this is done, but actually it's never done. Like it just keep going when you're in the business. Um, it also depends on how your business expand. Like the user could pivot and change based on maybe this person thing is a good big bet to put whole money to explore this type of user that could happen, but you might lose a lot of money, but that's a business decision. So there's so many ways to explore different type of user when you meet the business needs. Sometimes it's really tricky, I found out, but hey, I'm not putting the money in those business. I'm just gonna design it and you can have it, you know? So uh, I just kind of recap of like our um, user spectrum can expand and, and also going to so many, this is just super linear looking, it's actually, if I draw again, I would do circle. Mm. It's more like a ecosystem kind of thing. Um, and it's get a little bit more complex, complex when it comes to business design and research. And we try to fight the right thing. And everybody, everyone on the table thinks they fight the right, the right thing. So that's a difficult one. But anyway, um, I think that's, that's it for us. Thanks for having us. Um, so Questions? Room? Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in, in your collaboration, how that works, especially from you know the research researcher's perspective into you go into the research field, you have an idea, you've been researching, you like put your soul into that. And then all of a sudden you need to kind of transmit that idea to people who haven't done the research. So in a way you had to convince them of this is what is happening. Mm -hmm. So, and especially I, I like to, so how's that relationship especially with the most technical side of things with people who are just, hey, I'm just implementing this, that's not working. 
And then what is that kind of battle tension that you guys are finding, especially around the user, if when it comes up and you're talking about, but that's not what the user actually wants. And then they go, but how do you know what they want? That type of like back and forth. Uh, I can just speak into this if that's okay. No, it's not on. Um, so the user is subject to much discussion. <laughs> Everyone's got a view about what users need and how they interact with the product based on their experiences, based on experiences with competitor tools, based on places that they might have worked before, based on their knowledge as PMs or engineers or salespeople or whatever. So I think as a researcher, it's um, tempting to try and brand yourself as like the knowledgeable person about the user, but you're, you're just one person in an ecosystem where everybody has a view about users. And the more you can pull those perspectives in to how you talk about, think about, frame your research, describe it, the more effective you are at helping people kind of get on board. Um, I think transmitting the knowledge, we use a lot of video. Video is an effective tool, just showing like, so if you're a qualitative researcher, you're also a very badly trained video editor. We spend a lot of time cutting videos. Um, it's extremely painful and slow, but if you can give a busy person two minutes of 10 people encountering the same thing and going, oh, <laughs> I thought it worked like this when we know that it doesn't, that's very effective. Um, keep it short. I used to feel like I had to give every single detail and explain everything in very, you know, long winded ways. I think I've kind of learned that if it takes more than five minutes, people are going to disengage and draw their own conclusions because they're just very busy and they don't have time to kind of let you take them on the journey. There was this whole discussion, like when I worked in government, of taking the public service on the journey to making changes to, you know, large pieces of infrastructure like MyGov or whatever. I think in commercial contexts, we don't really have that luxury and you really have to fight for the cut through to get people on side. But the partnership that we have and that we've had with other designers and researchers helps as well, pardon me, Gig, because that means that there's somebody to take your kind of verbiage into something real in the product and people can find that a lot more, a lot easier to get behind. Do you know what I mean? Like if I can, I can tell them something, but Gig has to make it work. And if you can tell them the thing and give them a potential solution that they can get behind and possibly build, that's a lot more effective than saying people didn't understand X or people didn't like Y or we couldn't get them to click Z or whatever. But show don't tell. Yeah, sh show don't tell is something that we hear a lot. Do, do you want to add anything, Gig? No, I'm just going to say that okay. like it's just so hard to, some people disagree with the research too. Like, you know, the research, like, you're spec. So people disagree. And I'm like, how can you disagree, Jill? <laughs> and then, so what are we trying to convey? It's like, we use a lot of, like, like I put pro sometimes prototypes together to convince our stakeholders that it's the right directions, even though sometimes it's not. So, yeah. Like, what's it called? Picture, thousand words, a picture. <laughs> anyway, cliche, but true. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I was going to ask um, to... In what ways uh, is academia in the room in terms of research collaborations, in terms of um, books and articles that are written by in, in a university context uh, and so on? That's a really good question. Um, not so some user researchers have academic backgrounds, many don't. And um, I think we all just end up being kind of enculturated, enculturated into the private sector way of doing things. So we forget a lot of stuff, but you know, you can't, you can't hide it if it's in you. So it kind of comes up in all sorts of ways. I think one of the barriers to sharing texts is just paywalls. If you find something that you have a subscription to, you, you're trying to get reach, right? And you cannot share things that are paywalled, even just medium articles and stuff I've tried to share with people and they've gone, oh, if you're a paywall, oh, this sucks, you know? So I think the lack of access to those things and also probably the, when I started working in UX, there were these sort of canon canonical books, like the inmates is one of them. There's a, there's, you know, five or six of them that everyone had read. I feel like that's less of a thing now maybe because the field's gotten so much bigger so quickly. 
So it would be common for people who were senior to me, who I learned from to say, oh, well, it's what Cooper said about blah, blah, blah. And everyone would nod and go, okay, yeah, I get that. Now you, you'd say that and people would go, who's he? What? So like, it's not, <laughs> I think it's changed as the field's grown. Um, in our quantitative research, there's a lot of really frustrated academics who are like, no, we're not doing it that way. Like they're very strict about reporting and about sample and all these kinds of things. Um, and I guess in qual we're the same, but in a maybe a different way. We do di we do research differently to PMs, <laughs> but um, we have to constrain our natural tendencies to the environment and what it will reward. I suppose, and what will achieve any kind of impact. What do you think about design, like high levels sort of official design compared to product design? I, think I would just wing it. Every project, <laughs> whatever works and deliver, I just wing it. Yeah. Thanks for your uh, presentation today. Uh, so I've come over from design. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, mainly, uh, mainly because. Uh, what our um, thank you for showing some of my prototypes. Mm -hmm. That's where we are currently at in the going eight. No, no. So, um, yeah, I've got to my six who are currently working on the low five prototypes for this business. Um, so, my question I, it is piggybacking on, I think that um, it's a very academia type question. Uh, and it also draws in from uh, one of the earlier presentations this morning about design justice. So mm -hmm. I'm interested, like, I think, um, thank you for presenting the accessibility. Like, I think accessibility has now become, uh, it's a given. Yep. It needs to be in there. Mm -hmm. People need to be able to read it, to see it, to hear it, to have it be in a wonderful way. I'm interested in the question of that design justice or that design ethics because I often feel that with the, the focus on the user, it's at the expense of those who are not the user. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in design justice, I think, and especially with Atlas and this track record, you know, standing up for things like the media rights and so on. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, do you think there's an appetite for design justice um, within the that sort of tech fast moving industry, especially with our impacts, environmental mm. impacts, you know, all of the power that we use, um, et cetera, et cetera. Or again, does this just come down to business? And if it's not profitable, well, it, <laughs> you know, it's sort of it's just missed or it's overlooked. Like, is, is there a, a place for design justice? So I've got a sense, but Gig, do you want to go first? No, you no me? Okay. Because um, Gig's the designer and I'm not, so, you know, defer to the actual professional who does this as a job. Um, tricky question, this is how I'd answer it. Atlassian is a values-driven organisation and that makes an enormous difference to how it runs. From my point of view, as someone who has worked in organisations that are not values-driven, um, so I've worked in consultancies, for example, that are a very different set of business imperatives and a very different set of ways of working can also be huge fun and like great places to work, but they're, they're different. So I think the way that design justice would fold into the story would be around the fact that if you have a values driven, very self-consciously and very intentionally values driven organization, you tend to attract values driven people who want to stay because of the values. And that's quite a common narrative that we hear internally, I'd say. So I think while it wouldn't necessarily be framed exactly as you put it, yes, I think it's it's definitely a priority. And, you know, our, our founder and CEO is a very active environmentalist and putting himself out there in, in the public sphere with that kind of agenda. Um, so, yeah, I think it's definitely part of the story. And not just because you're in a commercial environment, it doesn't mean that all kind of good is subsumed to the dollar. Like you still have to hire the best people. You still have to retain them. You still have to be a business that people want to support and all of those things. It's not just kind of cynical branding or something. I think it does actually form um, part of what makes the business what it is, why people would want to be part of it, patronize it, engage with it, talk about it. 
all that sort of stuff, I think it is important. Um, what do you think, mate? Plus one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Plus one. Plus one, Jill. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've got a question about accessibility. So I'm particularly interested in how accessibility is implemented in the book publishing industry. And um, there is um, much better, of course, to implement accessibility from the start rather than try to remedy it at the end. How does Atlassian engage with accessibility? Like, what, what, where are you at? Okay, so we have accessibility champions, we have a backlog of work, um, we have specialist teams, and I think as with all kind of best practice design, it's, you know, I hate this phrase, but, you know, like baked in. So you would want to bake it into your design process, you'd bake it into your testing samples, you would um, think about the different range of impediments that you would need to design for. And like Gig said, you know, when you're thinking about any best practice design, you would include accessibility as part of the um, framing. Um, yeah, like um, I think we kind of in, like add it up in the beginning because we know that when you try to do accessibility work in a project scope, you need time, <laughs> you need extra time. So we're going to, I'm just going to tell PM heads up hey, we need another three days to do all this um, accessibility. Like I need time to finesse all the details to check it's like makes sense. I actually, they actually have to have like office hour with yeah. accessibility teams to go through a design. And at the same time, engineers also have to make sure to implement specific things to make sure that if like a person can, cannot see and at least like the screen reader is working, make sure it's in right order too that's something that we need to specify which is really interesting because really tedious um process but the team actually like so good they just make it so simple and everyone try to like follow it and and it's neat it takes the whole team to be like all right we need two weeks to do this so it's just like from the beginning but yeah there's a lot of details to work on but they make it so simple so i'm really appreciate that they set up a bunch of workshops and forced us and we we're like yes now i know you know yeah yeah like i think i think it's definitely something to think people think about when they're devising features when they're looking at the existing setups of things and um of course we do testing with users who have a range of impairments to ensure that our solutions work well for them um but as, as I said, we generally find quite similar <laughs> challenges to be really honest. So like it's if you if you make it better based on those design principles, you'll improve, you'll make the experience more accessible as well. Um, thanks, great presentation. Uh, I'm interested in understanding how you do user testing and what have you with emerging technologies like AI, for example, where it's actually hard for people to imagine what what it is or what it can do sometimes. I mean, they may have a, they may have, you know, some horrible chatbot experience that they've had that informs their ideas, but everything's evolving so quickly. So how do you kind of bring users into the, the integration of that into systems or how it might look or how it might be better? I'd be interested in the experiences that you have. Do you, have you, you're working on AI stuff, you go first. <laughs> so. It's a tricky one. Um, um, so to support AI and all the whole things, like I know, based on the Prezzo, we was trying to be like, here's traditional way, traditional, like the way that we're testing right now is like, here's a lo-fi, put in the customer and ask a bunch of like relevant questions. But now AI is almost like, it's like LLM, it's like a prediction of code. So you don't know what LLM going to spit. I don't know what the return. Sometimes it's random based on your history, based on what are you doing in, in, the, in the software. So having, so right now what we're trying to set up is like make sure we have the participants that um, will sign the D NDA, <laughs> basically. <laughs> to make sure that they're not telling other people about our stuff, but also like having the live LLM and our products live and ask them to have access in our products and then test it right there based on the task. Like um, the researcher and Jill will come up with, uh, we see what kind of tasks that the user will perform in that specific software or that specific journeys that they're trying to go for. And then we taste based on that and we actually measure it <laughs> and see like how they're doing it. But basically just like live, 
on the staging. So we try to push engineers to have it on staging, like have it live in our internal software and make sure that they could interact with it. But it's really tricky one to test because they, the user could be like, this is shit, but it's not me. It's LLM giving the, the result. So it's kind of like, um, kind of we in between are like, oh, all right, just take a grain of salt. And if it's not too bad, we're just going to chip it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing we do is the opposite, which is where we get super like controlled in the in the testing scenario and we do a lo-fi like wireframe style thing where we've designed the scenario to say okay and you're blah blah and this is what you're doing and you press this thing and it tells you this what do you think that is so it gives you a different kind of feedback like i've done that before for buyer experiences and things like that where you're trying to see not just whether they trust it which is one dimension but also whether they believe that it's helpful and more and more helpful than their own um, desire to explore something for example so those extremely controlled um, experiment styles can be helpful if you're trying to test that whereas i think gig is working in a, in a different way of testing ai so we do it in a whole different whole range of ways <laughs>